Hello and welcome to Granada Reports, live with the latest across the northwest. Hello, coming up on the programme. Little George lost his life because of an act of stupidity by a neighbour from hell. Tonight his dad speaks out. He's took something that can never be replaced. He had all his life in front of him. Didn't even have the chance to start nursery. Remanded in custody, Manchester United's Mason Greenwood in court accused of attempted rape. The crew of the Second World War bomber are honoured for saving lives as their aircraft crashed. The hug to celebrate winning a house in a raffle and how the new home is also great news for a children's hospice. After some dreamy weather around this weekend and to start the week, it's all changed over the next few days. The forecast will be later. Well, first tonight, a father from Lancashire has told how he was buried alive after a gas explosion that destroyed his home and claimed the life of his two-year-old son. It was a neighbour who'd caused the blast, a neighbour whose antisocial behaviour had been the subject of numerous complaints. Stephen Hines has been talking to our correspondent, Mar Barham, about that terrible night when he lost his little boy, George, and how he feels let down by the authorities. Revisiting here is just reliving a nightmare to know this was where my little boy took his last breath. <laughs> Stephen's son George was just two years old when he was killed last year in a massive explosion that destroyed his home. His neighbour Darren Greenham had cut a gas pipe in his own home to sell for scrap metal, causing a huge explosion which damaged more than 50 homes on this street in Heesham. We didn't actually hear the blast. We thought the ceiling had come through. Reality at home when you realise that it was bricks that had covered you up to your neck and then I just looked up and then it just all come down and it just piled and piled and piled and when you, you're lifeless and you can't move your arms and can't move your head and all you can do is try and take the little breaths that you could and I was just shouting for help. Stephen's partner, George's mum, Vicky, was lying beside him, trapped. Specialist teams had to jack the roof up to rescue her, but George couldn't be saved. Walking in a room to see six, seven doctors pumping up and down on your two-year-old, on his naked body, and just said there was nothing more they could do for him. Then they had to tell Vicky that her one and only son's gone. And I could hear her screams from the other side of the hospital. Two weeks ago, Darren Greenham, who was described in court as the neighbour from hell, was jailed for 15 years for George's manslaughter. But Stephen says they feel let down by the authorities, having complained numerous times to the police and council about Greenham's antisocial behaviour. The music could go on till two, three o'clock in the morning. There was loads of times I had to sleep on the couch downstairs because I was scared of him and his mates coming through the house. There will be families out there that's getting harassed by the neighbours and no one's listening to them. And then this shows, this shows what can happen. Lancaster City Council say Greenham was in the process of being evicted when he began stripping the house for cash. But because those proceedings are still ongoing, they can't comment further. Stephen and George's mum are now living in a caravan, financially ruined by the explosion. They say they've lost everything. He's took man and Vicky's life away. He's took something that can never be replaced. All the stuff from the house, all right, fair enough, we didn't get anything back, but they're not a child's life. He had all his life in front of him. Didn't even have the chance to start nursery. <laughs> They're now left with just memories of their son, but they plan to turn the land where their house once stood into a memorial garden. It's just going to be a place where everyone can come and remember him, and it's, it's going to be beautiful. And when, once, once it is finished, it will be absolutely amazing. Stephen says no sentence will ever make up for the loss of their son. The mental scars, he says, will live with them for the rest of their lives. Mel Barham, ITV News, Hesham. Well, after the court case, Lancashire Police told us they had reviewed all previous police contact and were satisfied the appropriate action within their policing powers was taken at the time. 
Next, a report found UEFA's organisation of last season's Champions League final in Paris put lives at risk and police treatment of fans constituted criminal assault. Yes, Liverpool fans were pepper sprayed by French police and robbed by local gangs outside the Stade de France in May. Supporters were initially blamed for the chaos, but new findings based on hundreds of testimonies found that UEFA's pre-match preparation was inadequate. Well, earlier I spoke to the report's author, Professor Phil Scrayton from Queen's University Belfast, who was the lead author for the reports. I think that one of the most disconcerting things about this report is when you actually see people who have particular vulnerabilities. Now, women aren't vulnerable, but they're certainly vulnerable to sexual assault. And when you actually read that some of the male stewards sexually assaulted women as they searched them, when you read that the children's health and welfare was compromised uh, at, at every level, and when you see that people who are dis had disabilities one person being carried over, bodily carried over, uh, into the stadium while his wheelchair followed him. When, that's when you realise that the preparedness was, was poor. But alongside that, and what is really important to stress, is that I don't think anybody was prepared for the level of police hostility. Police who were in paramilitary gear, who actually pepper spray or tear gas people in a confined space who were doing nothing other than queuing while the gates were opening and shutting and they weren't being allowed in and so on. That level of hostility was remarkable. Many of those fans never went into the stadium. They left. When they came out of the stadium, it appeared that things were free. They were free to go. They go to the underpass, come up from the underpass and get close to the stadium and their tear gas began thrown to the ground, children, women. That situation was remarkable in a capital city in Europe. With all of that in mind, do you have confidence that the French authorities, UEFA, will learn the lessons learned from this report? Because Liverpool fans and fans right across the region will inev inevitably be going uh, to France in the future. What we found was that there were egregious failures on all aspects of UEFA's responsibility for stadium safety. That includes optimum flow of people, fully operational turnstiles, clear walkways, uh, oh, and CCTV provision. And at the moment, there is no guarantee that that will happen at future events. It, it will be easy for them to say that the negligent management, the poor stewarding, the aggressive policing, the criminal assaults by gangs and the police on fans was a one-off. Well, they have to prove that. And, Professor, just give us a sense um, about the impact that uh, this whole episode has had on those Liverpool fans who were there that night. When we asked for statements from fans, we expected to have a number of relatively short state statements. We had nearly 500 detailed state statements, and they came within days of the event. And what those statements demonstrated was the impact on those people now at home, the impact financially, the impact in terms of their own confidence, and their impact in terms of their own health and welfare. And when we talk about health and welfare, it wasn't just broken bone and scar tissue. It was health and welfare psychologically, people who will be damaged and hurt for many years to come and who will not go into crowded spaces again. This is remarkable that we are even having a conversation like this concerning a capital city in Europe in 2022. The report makes for difficult reading. OK, Professor Phil Straton, I appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Well, we contacted UEFA, who said they wouldn't be commenting until the independent review report is published next month. Now, Manchester United's Mason Greenwood has appeared in court charged with attempted rape and assault. The players also accused of coercive control. Rob Smith was at Manchester's Magistrates Court. The Manchester United footballer is on remand tonight after his first appearance before a judge here. Mason Greenwood driven away in a prison van, remanded in custody, facing charges of attempted rape, assault and engaging in coercive and controlling behaviour. He appeared in the dock here at Manchester Magistrates 
wearing a grey hoodie, grey jogging bottoms, white T-shirt, spoke only to confirm his name, his address and his date of birth. The striker was originally arrested back in January. The alleged attempted rape said to have happened in October last year. All the charges relating to the same woman. He's been suspended from playing with or training with Manchester United since the allegations first emerged. Members of Mr Greenwood's family were in court for this hearing, a hearing that is set a date for his next appearance before a judge. That will be at a Crown Court in this city on November 21st. Rob Smith reporting there. Now, an inv investigation's underway into claims that a pro-democracy campaigner was dragged into the grounds of the Chinese consulate in Manchester and assaulted. Scuffles broke out outside the building on Sunday afternoon, with footage on social media apparently showing one protester being beaten inside the consulate grounds. There have been calls for an explanation from the Chinese ambassador. People from Hong Kong moved to the UK for a reason. We expect we have a certain amount of freedom here, no matter it's press freedom, freedom to express, and uh, freedom from fear. Uh, we, we did, everyone there did not expect some, something like this would, would happen in the United Kingdom, which is uh, quite shock, shocking to all of us. Police are treating a fire that destroyed parts of a school in Lancashire as suspicious. It broke out in the nursery of Highfield Priory School in Fulwood on Saturday, with firefighters working overnight to bring the fire under control. No arrests have been made. Well, next, to the tributes paid today to the Australian bomber crew who've been hailed heroes for their actions during the Second World War in the skies over the northwest. Yeah, this is really remarkable. Nearly 80 years ago, they managed to steer their stricken plane away from homes, crushing it instead into nearby allotments. Two of the men on board were killed, as Emma Sweeney now reports. They were foreign servicemen who, for the people of Seoul, became local heroes successfully steering their crippled aircraft into an allotment while miraculously avoiding nearby houses along the way. Today, almost 80 years on, a memorial was unveiled in their honour. That will educate and remind people for years to come about the sacrifices made by the Allied Airmen of Bomber Command. Engine failure caused two of the servicemen to lose their lives that night, but only for their actions, the death toll could have been much higher. It clipped a, uh, uh, a telegraph pole uh, and brought down the wires. Now, they are lower than the roofs of the local houses, so they must have been able to raise it over the roofs of these houses, saving the people in the houses, of course, and, uh, and then, of course, the crash landed here, belly flopped, in effect, uh, here in Walton Park in Sale. The Wellingtons exhibit their versatility. The crew, who were on board a Wellington bomber, were on their way to Blackpool for a training exercise. When the plane fell from the sky at close to midnight, all of those on board were a long way from home. Five of them were Australians and one was an Irishman. And as you say, George, two of the men died on the night, but actually all of the men went on to die later on in the war, bar one of them. Yes, they, they all died later, uh, apart from the wireless operator, and he was so badly wounded that he, he never flew operationally again. Today, as the memorial was officially unveiled, members of the Royal Australian Air Force, the RAF, local residents and school children alike came together to pay their respects. Because he gave his lives to help other people. They saved quite a lot of people around this area. The least I can do is come down and pay my respects. It's a story like so many that could have easily been lost with the passage of time. But now the monument will stand as a permanent reminder of that fateful night back in 1943. Emma Sweeney, ITV News, Sale. What are your dancing moves like? Not as good as that. <laughs> no, mine either. <laughs> mine either. Um, OK, next. And uh, after almost two years, commuter ferries return to Seacombe today, taking passengers from Wallasey to Liverpool. Yes, it follows a major upgrade of the ferry terminal that's welcomed passengers for hundreds of years. The Explorer ferries, which are popular with tourists, also return to the water. Jamal Williams-Thomas was there for us. 
This morning, commuters in Wallasey have once again been able to enjoy this view on their way to work. Mersey ferries have started their commuter service again from the Seacombe ferry terminal after being shut for two years due to refurbishment work. These works were absolutely integral uh, to be done. Actually kind of replacing things like the link span bridges, upgrading the pontoon that was stood on, as well as a significant upgrade to the booking office facility. So a big multi-million pound project. The works are part of a wider scheme to regenerate the Wirral coastline, which includes a new museum due to open in the coming weeks. And even with other modes of public transport available to get across the Mersey, the ferry still remains a popular choice, with around 250 people a day opting to cross the water. Catching the ferry to work is quite a unique way of commuting. Passengers say that actually it takes away the stress of being on a crowded bus or train, and for cyclists, plenty of room for bikes. It's so much more relaxed. The ferry is, you know, you've got freedom, you can get a drink. Um, they normally have free coffees in the terminal, it's on the boat. It's only 30 minutes walk and then I get the boat across. It's 10 minutes, cheapest way to get to Liverpool, best way to get to Liverpool and I've been doing it for 35 years. The Mersey ferries are absolutely vital. They're a real unique and very special part of not just life on the River Mersey, but actually life in our city region. The Woodside ferry terminal down the road in Birkenhead is the next terminal to get a spruce up. The investment is something that will keep this Merseyside institution going for a long time yet. Jamal Williams-Thomas, ITV News, Seacombe. Well, next, into the family from Preston, who've won a family home worth a quarter of a million pounds in a raffle draw. Yeah, this is all in aid of Dairy and House Children's Hospice, and every penny will go towards giving young children the care and the support they deserve during the toughest of times. The hospice has managed to raise more than £450,000, enough to keep it running for two months. Tim Scott has been to meet the lucky winners. <laughs> The moment that Charles Morn and his partner Kerry Moyer were declared winners of a raffle to win a house. We've seen back the pictures of it happening and just our faces, I think, say it all. It's just disbelief, absolute shock and disbelief. The three-bedroom new build on the outskirts of Blackburn is worth over a quarter of a million pounds. And Charles and Kerry are generously giving it to Kerry's son Lewis and his partner Autumn, who are expecting their first child next month. Just beyond words how excited they are and it, it, it all falls into place, the location of the property and yeah. um, everything around the baby arriving, um, it just couldn't have, have worked out any better really. But the story of this house gets even better. The raffle that Charles and Kerry won raised over £400,000 for the Derry and House Children's Hospice in Chorley after the house was gifted as a prize in the raffle by developers Kingswood Homes. We've had people who have been supported by Derry and House in the past anyway. We've got close family friends who have relied on Derry and House and wow, they've supported okay. them and we knew the great work they did. And the fact that Derry and House raised 460000 um, is the icing on the cake yeah. um, because that was the whole reason we, mm. were, we were there. It's over £460,000. That's going to contribute well in excess of 10% of our annual running costs. So you can imagine what a massive difference that makes to a charity like Derry and House. Yeah, you know, it's been uh, really good for Kingswood to be a part of it and um, everyone's enjoyed it. And it's nice to see the, the development stages of the house and now it's ended up going into, into good hands in, in, a, in a lovely family and everyone's made up for the winner. A fantastic windfall then for Derry and House and a new home for Charles and Kerry's children and stepchildren. A lovely end to a lovely story. Tim Scott, ITV News, Blackburn. Congratulations, Charles and Kerry. I mean, all for a good cause as well. Yeah, very made up for them, but uh, also a little bit jealous as well. Uh, here's Joe with the weather. Why do I need a shower? I've been out in the rain. The faster you go, the sooner you'll be out. You'll save water too. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Thank you. A very good evening to you. Hope you managed to see a little bit of sunshine today. If not today, maybe again tomorrow. Another beautiful day in prospect. Wind's really dropping out. After tomorrow, though, our weather will become more unsettled. Blustery showers moving in through the rest of the week and some really gusty winds Wednesday and Thursday. Atlantic fronts will be allowed to move in from Wednesday onwards and that's going to bring unsettled conditions across the country. For us, showers, still some sunshine in the mix, but really gusty winds and not the best feeling to the day either. 
but tomorrow a lovely window of fine weather to come with plenty of sunshine. After quite a blustery afternoon, those winds begin to drop out as we go into this evening and overnight. They're changing direction and under clear skies, one or two shallow mist and fog patches could form for parts of Cheshire and Derbyshire tonight. And as well as that, it's a little chillier perhaps than last night. Three or four Celsius, rurally down low enough for a touch of grass frost before tomorrow morning. On to tomorrow, a chilly start to the day. The sun will be up at 7.43, setting at eight minutes past six. The mist and fog across those southern counties will lift during the course of tomorrow morning quite early on. For the rest of us, not a bad start to the day at all. Lots of sunshine around and it will be a dry day tomorrow. Although winds are from a slightly cooler direction, they're falling very light. So on paper, temperatures are just down on today's values at around 14 or 15 degrees. But it should feel really pleasant tomorrow afternoon in the sunshine. Looking ahead and it's all changed from Wednesday onwards. Blustery showers, gusty winds. At least it's mild both by day and night. No danger of any frost. Enjoy your evening. See you soon. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Thanks, Joe. That's it for now. We're back after news at 10. And, of course, there's more on our website, itvnews.com slash Granada. Uh, Here comes the sunshine. Uh, I am glad to say that tomorrow we are back with uh, the Lightning Seeds. Uh, they're back with their first studio album for a decade. For now, good night.